Welcome to our virtual Earth lecture series, which we used to run downtown in Manhattan with about 50 people, 60 people. And now we typically get several hundred people coming along to these. And I think tonight is the same. Uh, each month we bring our science and policy experts to you. We are taking a look at two exciting new books and the work of their authors, both professors at Columbia University. Both books consider different ways to navigate our astonishing, uncertain times. Uh, and both books put forth big ideas that speak to this unprecedented moment, unprecedented moment in history. From the coronavirus pandemic to the climate change crisis to the political and ideological polarization dividing so much of American society, these are urgent times that call for conflict resolution of the highest order. We need only look to the events of the US Capitol on January 6th just to comprehend how diverse, diverse, divisive uh, a moment this is. So we stand at a sort of an inflection point, uh, and for many of us, all of this has caused anxiety and some level of questioning. With me tonight are two leading Columbia University thought leaders in the area of sustainable societies. Both have positive and unique approaches to navigating our difficult times, and both have new books to talk to us about. The first, is Ruth de Vries. Uh, Ruth is the Denning Family Professor of Sustainable Development in the Department of Ecology, Evolution and Environmental Biology. Ruth uses images from satellites and field surveys to examine how the world's demands for food and other resources are actually changing land use throughout the tropics. Her research quantifies how these land use changes affect climate, biodiversity, and other ecosystem services, as well as human development. She also has developed innovative education programs in sustainable development. Uh, among her many honors, Ruth received a Mark MacArthur Genius Award. Um, her commitment to communicating the nuances and complexities of sustainable development um, to, to popular audiences is pretty much unmatched. And she wrote an amazing book, uh, The Big Ratchet, How Humanity Thrives in the face of natural crisis, which you may have already read, which came out a couple of years ago uh, and drew international acclaim. Tonight, we'll be diving into her new book, which is this one here, What Would Nature Do? A Guide for Our Uncertain Times, and it's just out. So um, order all your copies after tonight. We'll see what happens. Okay, also with us tonight is Columbia Professor Peter Coleman. He is executive director of the Advanced Consortium on Cooperation, Conflict and Complexity in the Earth Institute. And he will discuss his new book, The Way Out, How to Overcome Toxic Polarization. I can't hold it up because I've only got a PDF because it isn't quite out yet, but uh, it's, a, it's an interesting read, an amazing read. So I'm looking forward to talking to him about that. Peter is a social psychologist and researcher in the field of conflict resolution and sustainable peace. He is well known for his work on intractable conflicts and applying complexity science. He's also leading the Sustainable Peace Project, a multidisciplinary A-team of internationally known researchers who are working to create a model of the dynamics that promote and sustain peaceful societies. So welcome, both of you. Great to have you here. Uh, Ruth, um, let me start off with you, just a, just a warm up question. The depth and breadth of your research has led you to study the world's food security and to deeply understand the cues the natural world gives us to keep our planet sustainable. So what set you on this path? Well, first, thanks everyone out there for joining. And it's such a pleasure to be here with you, Alex, and with Peter, whose book is just fantastic. I would highly recommend it. So my upbringing and most of my career has been in a time when there's just been an incredible rise in prosperity around the world, uneven, inequitable, but big achievements, big technological achievements like going to the moon, increasing food production, uh, great progress in public health, reducing infant mortality and so on. But now in the world that we are currently in, in our uncertain world, uh, we see that this path of technological fixes and efficiencies that was the way that we thought about the world in the 20th century uh, doesn't really work anymore. And we are 
uh, particularly vulnerable to shocks like the pandemic and climate change. So to quote Albert Einstein, you cannot solve a problem with the same sort of thinking that created the problem. So my book is about thinking what might be another sort of thinking and particularly yeah. looking to nature. So I look forward to talking to, with you about that this evening. Okay. Uh, so Peter, let's turn to you. Um, your work goes very deeply um, into the many aspects of conflict and peace. Uh, when did you decide to follow this vocation? Because uh, I thought you started off in, in drama and things like this, and now you've ended up doing this amazing work. T um, tell us how the principles of cooperation have shaped your work. Right. So uh, I think um, the genesis of this is probably that I grew up in the, in the 1960s in Chicago when there was a lot of tumult on the streets. And so even as a seven, eight year old, I was aware of the fact that there were marches and protests and sort of violent shutdowns of the protest. Um, so that was definitely part of me as a young person. And then jump ahead and in the late 80s, I, I worked um, with violent adolescents, uh, uh, 12 to 28 year olds that were in psychiatric hospitals or drug and alcohol rehab hospitals. And um, oftentimes they were there because they had committed violent, violent crimes or drug, drug trafficking. And so I worked with them um, in a, what became an increasingly violent atmosphere. And I was interested in trying to understand how to help them and what the causes of this were. And I was interested at the time in clinical psychology and working with them as individuals. But what I found is that the kind of system of forces that was driving their return to this hospital again and again, right? That it wasn't just about them, it was about the environments that they came from and they returned to. So that's what really got me interested in that. I started to read, I had no, intellectual or conceptual background in this. I had an intuition to, uh, about how to work with these young people, but I didn't know what I was doing. So I started to read and I found an eminent theorist at Columbia named Morton Deutsch, who uh, had done groundbreaking work on, on conflict resolution and in cooperation and competition as different approaches to conflict. And his work had been influential from preschool to the United Nations. He's, he had a major impact. So I came to Columbia to study with him and I got stuck here and haven't left since. Well, it's great to have you. It's been wonderful to get to know you the last few years while I've been here at the Earth Institute. Um, so let's dive straight in. Uh, we've got an inauguration tomorrow uh, and uh, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden are being inaugurated. Fantastic to see this happening. And at the same time, it's in the midst of considerable uh, concern about uh, what's been happening just recently and, and, and the situation that these two are actually heading into in terms of the United States. How urgent do you think this moment really is, considering the various threats that have been on the horizon? I'll ask you both this question. Just give me a, what do you think quickly, a couple of quick answers. So shall I go first? Sure. Sounds great. <laughs> so I'm going to take your question, Alex, and turn it from this exact moment with the inauguration to this moment in our existence as a human species, which is really just a moment, a sliver in time uh, relative to the millions and millions of years that humans have been on the planet and even infinitesimal amount of time relative to the 4.5 billion uh, year history of the earth. But at this moment in human existence, we have never experienced a situation like we have now we, where we are so interconnected, where places and people all over the world are woven into this complex system, which leads to all these kinds of unpredictable outcomes that we see, like the pandemic, like the virus spreading all over the um, world in a matter of days. And on top of that, we've never experienced an atmosphere like, like we are experiencing now in, in the history of human civilization. So the urgency is, uh, is for this moment in human existence to think about how we organize ourselves as a society to be resilient to the kinds of shocks that we are seeing and that we will continue to see into the future. We have no no roadmap, no guidebook as this 
this way of being as a as a species. Right. Peter, what's your take on this moment in history? Well, I really appreciate uh, Ruth's um, perspective on this. It reflects the, the large swath and perspective of, of your book because she really does think about these long-term trends and these um, out of control dynamics that we have to better understand and be able to control. And, and my book in parallel focuses particularly on political polarization and the toxic nature of it today here and, and else, elsewhere around the world. Um, and I do think that this is an urgent time now. Uh, I do think it's urgent for a couple of reasons. One, because it's part, so the political polarization happening in the US is part of a something like 50 year trajectory of increasing political polarization, both in terms of seeing it in DC and our leaders, leaders and ability to work together and dysfunction there, as well as just attitudes and geographical sorting that's happening uh, on the ground. So this is a long-term trend and it is coming to a, a frenzied pitch at this point. Um, and that's the bad news. The good news is that it does provide what both Ruth and I write about, which are kind of destabilizing shocks. You know, the combination of the Trump administration's approach to politics, of COVID, of the economic downturn, of the crisis of climate change is coming up, you know, racial injustice, this combination of things is happening is really destabilizing a lot of our basic assumptions about ourselves, our relationships, our neighbors, and our governance. Um, and I think that can be, under certain conditions, a good thing if we know how to take advantage of that kind of instability. Hmm. Right, right. And actually, you know, so in terms of stability, Ruth, the guiding principle in your book um, is that about humanity not being prepared for a challenging, surprising crisis. Um, so, uh, of course, surprise, pandemic, uh, although we have been talking about pandemics for a heck of a long time and nobody seems to have been prepared despite that. Um, so, um, tell us about, you referred to the twin dragons of a changing climate and an interconnected economy. And, you know, it strikes me uh, that there are some interesting things here about being unprepared, but also some interesting things about um, the twin dragons of climate and the interconnected economy that actually may lead to surprises as well, uh, that we're quite vulnerable potentially going forward. Do you want to tell us a bit more about this? Sure. So the dragons refers to the medieval uh, Lenox Globe, which is in the New York Public Library, which is famously inscribed with the words, here be dragons, mm. uh, to alert explorers when they were entering uncharted uh, territory. So that's the metaphor for humanity being in uncharted territory from these twin dragons, one being the globalized interconnected world that we live in where a virus can emerge in a faraway town and spread around the world in a matter of, of days. Or we can have uh, cascading climate extremes which affects food production in one part of the world which leads to food riots in a far distant part of the world, uh, combined with the other twin dragon, which is our changing climate leading to a world that, uh, that we really can't imagine uh, how it will play out. And they're linked because it is our globalized world and all of the great achievements and success and, and uh, technology and rise in pr prosperity that has also created the uh, global economy and dependence on fossil fuels, which is our climate problem. So they are, they are linked. And what the, in the book, what I try to do is, is uh, think about how this complex world that we now live in with unpredictable shocks like the pandemic, like climate extremes, like political upheavals, uh, how, how we might look to nature for strategies for being resilient to those kinds of shocks. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's quite interesting. So, um, you know, the inter I mean, the interesting thing for me is that the interconnected world is something we usually espouse as a strength of society. And, you know, we think actually it's, it's great to be able to get our food from all over the place and enjoy wonderful things we never used to be able to enjoy in terms of, um, uh, you know, the globalization of food supply. 
And at the same time, it leaves us very vulnerable. It means that pretty much nobody on the planet is immune to the effects of climate change. Um, that, you know, the, the British are going to be using, you know, feedstocks for their cattle that are going to be coming from Arizona or Southwest US or something like that and going to be hammered by drought. And so it's kind of, you know, even the, even the fairly well-off parts of society today are going to be quite severely connected and, and damaged by what's happening elsewhere in the world. Yeah, there's no question that the, this um, interconnectedness of the world has enormous benefits for sharing information, for uh, you know, delivering health services, for getting food around the world, for you know, incredible benefits. And we see that. Uh, but it also makes us fragile and vulnerable to shocks, which can cascade throughout the system like we've seen with the supply chain problems during the uh, pandemic. But what I wanna think about in the book is it's not an either or. It's not that we should all, you know, be live on, uh, uh, be subsistence farmers or we should all live in a globalized world. It's how do we take advantage of our, the benefits of our globalized world and have the strategies which minimize our vulnerability to uh, to the to the risks, and that's exactly the kinds of questions, problems that evolution has faced and has. Uh, so, and there are strategies in nature which. So tell, us, uh, tell us about a bit more about that. So I mean, if if you basically um, the, the the nature solution is a sort of um, trial and error thing, right? That actually, to some extent. So um, in what, which particular things, in which ways do you think we, we will learn through trial and error or through nature's approach that might be uh, helpful? And is, there, is it your belief that there's an opportunity here to gather lessons from mistakes and from the natural world um, uh, that actually will help us figure our way through epidemics and climate catastrophes going forward? Yeah, and absolutely. So nature, life on earth has seen a lot of shocks. Asteroids crashing into the earth, you'd know all about that, Alex. Uh, extinctions, diseases, swings in climate, all kinds of shocks. So it has persisted, nature has persisted because there are these, um, these strategies that, uh, that make nature resilient. So one of the strategies, going back to the connectedness and, and networks is about the design of networks to benefit from networks connectedness, but also to be safeguarded against the, uh, the risks that that poses. So if you think about a leaf vein, for example, there's a network there, a very important network that has to carry water all throughout the leaf. And if the leaf gets torn, something happens to it, gets a bite of an insect, then that that's a real danger to, uh, to the plant. So evolution's um, way of, of dealing with that is to keep the network essential, as essential to the leaf as it is to our human civilization, but to invest in redundant networks, re lots of little, lots of veins. So there are multiple options to get from point A to point B. So if there's a tear, there's a way around it. So there is a cost. There is an investment in those extra veins, the materials and energy to build that, but that inefficiency pays off when there is a shock. So we've learned that in the pandemic, we uh, thinking about the supply chains, and now there's a lot of people talking about building redundancy into supply chains. Right. So, um, sorry, Peter, I'll get to you in a minute. I'm not totally ignoring you, but <laughs> this is really interesting. So, uh, Ruth. You, you actually use stories a lot in your, you know, in your book. Can you just give, give an example of uh, a, a story that, that powerfully illustrates, powerfully but simply illustrates a complex principle? Is, is the maybe, um, well, come on. Yeah, so I was trying to, I was looking for examples and stories where uh, people have come to realize that those strategies that nature uh, uses for resilient to build resilience actually work. And uh, the, interestingly, many of the examples that I found were in finance and in uh, engineering. So one example, for example, um, for instance, 
is the story of uh, Paul Barron. Paul Barron was, I think I'm pronouncing his name wrong, probably, apologies, but, uh, but he was an engineer with the Rand Corporation during the Cold War. So his task was to advise the Defense Department about how to structure the communications network to be uh, resilient to an attack, uh, you know, a, a nuclear attack. So what he presented was exactly this idea of a redundant network like the leaf veins that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. He was laughed out of the room. He was young. He was just not given any, uh, any attention to his ideas. But over the decades, that's exactly the strategy that has proven to be resilient in communication strategies. That's the basis for the internet. So I'm sure Paul Barron wasn't thinking about a, a, a leaf, <laughs> but that is the same kind of redundancy in networks and investment in inefficiency in a way to be able to be to build um, resilience right. to shock. So, I mean, just to finish off, I mean, your book suggests that the 20th century was all about creating efficiency and it sounds like actually what you need in some cases is inefficiency. Uh, so is the 20th century, 21st century all going to be about going to be all about um, resilience as you use that word is that going to be the main focus that we're going to be thinking about as we try and carve a, some kind of a direction through the, um, the choppy waters ahead i do think so so the 20th century we saw a lot of achievements a lot of technological achievements uh, based on this idea of of uh, fixes of uh, kind of uh, both peter and i talk about the idea of of, of clockwork as, a, as a, a fix, a quick fix, not so quick, probably, but uh, technological fixes, that there are solutions to problems, linear solutions. You have a problem, you find a solution. But in the 21st century, what we see now with, uh, again, the pandemic and, and climate and all of the inequality, um, all of the many problems that we face, there are not simple, easily fixed solutions. So, uh, so it's so interesting that Peter and I both frame our books around the same idea that we are now living in this complex system, this unpredictable world, this world full of nonlinearities where quick fixes and silver bullets um, really don't apply to many of our problems. And how do we think about um, solutions and addressing those problems Peter calls them cloud problems uh, in a way that will be effective and uh, and um, and will work for us as a society. Yeah, right. Okay, Peter, let's let's turn to see let's see what you think of what Ruth just said. So, uh, uh, Peter, you, how would you characterize the challenges that we face right now? Because you've come at this from a, a totally different perspective, independently. Um, do you see the way forward and the idea of nature's strategies as a useful way of thinking about solving crises, or do you think we have to do something different? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think we need both. I think uh, certain crises, certain problems uh, do lend themselves to more technical solutions. We've seen that over the last hundred years. But when those crises are very complex and changing and dynamic, um, and good faith attempts to resolve them or to address them through, through technologies don't help, then we have to learn to think about them and work with them in very different ways, I think. So I, I do think uh, we, it's a combination of both. I, I wrote a book in 2011 called The 5% because mm -hmm. I was studying these difficult long-term conflicts like our pattern of polarization today that don't seem to respond to well-intentioned attempts to work them out. So we have tools of diplomacy and mediation and just negotiation and talk, um, which most of the time resolves most of our difficult conflicts. But in the international realm, they estimate about 5% of our more difficult conflicts just get stuck for you know, 30, 40, 50, 100 years. Um, and why is that? And so when you have those kinds of change-resistant problems, Usually it is because they're 
complex problems with a variety of different changing elements. And so you have to think about them differently and work with them differently. So do you see um, the situation we're in today um, as a time of unprecedented division? Do you, I mean, you talk about the toxic polarization that we are finding ourselves in. Um, do you think, I mean, how unusual is it? I mean, that society has of course been gone through quite a history of, of polarization and, and division. So how toxic is it right now, do you think, on the scale of what? Yeah, it's, I, I mean, I think it is pretty acute in the US right now. It isn't necessarily, every, obviously everywhere like this. Um, and the US has had its problems. We had a civil war, so we had, you know, a long tip into violence. We, there have been, you know, protests against the Vietnam War. There, there have been, movements and there have been high levels of societal tension throughout our history. But what's problematic about this one, again, is that it's a long-term trend. So it's now 50 or 60 years of these trajectories, depending on what you're measuring. Um, and it is culturally embedded. It's sort of baked into a lot of the cultural values that, that distinguish different parts of our country. Um, and you put on top of that media, Right, the entertainmentization of media and the creation of these ecosystems that are really parallel realities and the internet and algorithms that sort of pit, it, pit us against each other. And so there are these layers of both technology and kind of cultural dynamics and value differences that are feeding each other and creating the storm that isn't, is not, does not lend itself to simple solutions. Um, you know, I, I, I know that you're interested in the in the, the Biden inauguration tomorrow, and I've been um, offering memos to the transition team about what to do about polarization. And part of what, frankly, I think is that you know the president of the United States can't can't fix this. Right, this is not a fix, and it's not. And being a, a political in political office around a political conflict um, is not a great place to be. Um, at this time, not only will it sort of uh, derail his uh, abilities to address certain problems, but um, he is, you know, a suspect um, for half of this country. So it will take a, a, a constellation of efforts. In fact, I think it will take a societal movement. I think it really will take a kind of a community-based movement. I think the presidential administration can help they can get out of the way, they can reduce the heat and the, the, the divisive rhetoric um, and the attacks on the other side. So there's a lot that they can do, um, but ultimately I do think it's going to take more than the US government to address this, uh, this current problem. So how, what actually, how, how have we teetered to the point from going from healthy debate to what is now a corrosive political climate? Yeah. Um, because it strikes me that there was always this wonderful thing about America, same is true in the UK to some extent, that actually, you know, you know, you had Republicans and you had Democrats and it gave the US remarkable stability. I mean, you, nobody would really ever cause a revolution in America because you had this just, you just move things slightly to the left, you move things slightly to the right. Right. It's a bit the same in the UK. And instead we're seeing more dramatic polarization going on, both in the UK and here, of course. Yeah. And, um, you know, and now it's actually got to something that doesn't feel like debate any longer. Um, how did that happen? So, of course, it's that my answer is it's complex, right? There, there are many things that happen, and there are people that will point to the 1990s uh, to, first of all, the Reagan administration and the, the, the conservative revolution, or Newt Gingrich. Newt Gingrich um, did some things in Washington. He did a simple thing in Washington. He um, changed the, so he was the Speaker of the House uh, from 1995 to 1999. And he uh, asked, he changed the work week in Washington. And so it used to be that uh, Congress people would come for five days a week. And so they'd move their families to Washington and he changed it to three days a week. And he said to his Republican colleagues, don't move here. Don't fraternize with the other side, stay home, raise money and you know, let's fight this war. And so it was a change not only in attitude, but it was a change in the social fabric of Washington, D.C. From the beginning of Washington, D.C., families moved there. Kids grew up together. They played Little League together. They were, you know, socially together. So it was much harder 
when you were fighting about legislation to vilify or to become violent, right? And now it's easier because there's so little social contact uh, in there. So that is one of the factors. And, and some people would point to that. I do think that was a tipping point in DC in terms of the vitriol that we see, but you have to put on top of that, the changing media landscape, the entertainmentization and therefore politicization of media, the internet and the power of the internet to distract us and attract our attention to the extremes. There are multiple dimensions that are contributing to this that are feeding each other in this complex way. Okay, so to what extent, I mean, maybe this is for both of you actually, um, you make the distinction in your books um, between complex and clockwork problems. So um, is it fair to say that whether we are dealing with political polarization or feeding humanity, the idea is the same, uh, to recognize that these are complex problems that simply can't lead, can't be dealt with by simple technical solutions? Ruth, do you want to? Yeah, first, I, when I read that in your book, Peter, it reminded me so much. I grew up in the DC area and uh, you know, across the street was a congressman from Alabama and I went to school with these kids. And now that I think about, think back on it, it was this diversity of uh, political views, uh, mm -hmm. which I think may have led to some uh, understanding and tolerance. So interestingly, that is one strategy of nature is diversity. Diver uh, that's the hallmark of nature to have diversity and uh, options for the future. If one species goes extinct, there's another one to, to take its place. So it's interesting that you know, both of our books are, are founded on this these ideas uh, that come from complexity science. I use nature as a metaphor for the complex system. You use the, uh, the political uh, conflict situation, but the idea is the same, that in these complex systems, there are unpredictable outcomes and we have to think about these problems in a different way. So the, the ways that the strategies that I thought were important uh, learning from nature were this idea of maintaining diversity, which you just talked about, uh, the idea of designing networks, how networks are constructed like the leaf veins, the idea of self-organization um, for decision-making from the bottom up, which you also address in your book, Peter, and the ability to pull back from the brink of catastrophe, which is also one of your Themes. So, so there's quite a lot in common, although the top topics are quite different. Uh, a lot in common with these strategies that come from nature and the strategies that you you discuss about uh, polarization. So, so pulling ourselves back from the brink, you know, is that the attack on the Capitol on January the sixth? Was that actually a moment when people said, "Whoa, we've gone too far." Well, I don't know, you could say that the election was perhaps uh, pulling back from, from the brink. But the idea is that in nature, there are, nature is full of these kinds of self-regulating uh, mechanisms to keep homeostasis, the way our, our blood sugar is regulated with different mm -hmm. hormones that keep a fairly even the way uh, carbon is cycled throughout the atmosphere and the oceans that keeps, uh, that keeps the homeostasis kind of steady state, self-regulating kinds of, of uh, mechanisms. Okay. Peter, what do you think? Well, I do think that the, the violence at the Capitol was a, a profoundly symbolic moment for America to see our Capitol overrun by people who were armed and then to learn more and more about what happened inside and how, how planned it was. And, how dangerous, dangerous it, it, it was for some and potentially for many of the legislators, um, I think is a, is a tipping point in some ways for some people. I mean, you know, it seems to have been for Mitch McConnell, for example, right? So, the, so I, I do think for some, it, it did have to come to a point where violence was evident and obvious. Um, and so in some ways that's, again, potentially a hopeful thing if more and more people sort of feel. What, what, what we find in, in the pattern of long-term conflicts is that they need a couple of basic conditions in order for people to really want to change. And one is, again, misery. P 
people have to feel miserable, exhausted, spent, fed up. Um, and we were talking amongst us before the event that most of us are these days, you know, we're exhausted and we really are looking for a more functional, more functional leaders and problem solving um, and for less enmity and animosity, you know, coming at us from the media and coming at us from even our, our, our own communities. So that's good news that we're at a place where people are exhausted, are afraid of what the, of worse things to come. Um, but now, in addition to that, what we do need to provide, them, I think the public is a sense of what to do about it. And I think a lot of the proposals uh, and strategies that Ruth has elicited from nature, as I said, are some of them are very parallel with what we've found in the world of peace and conflict to be particularly helpful. And part of it is understanding that there is a way out of this and that we can affect change. Um, and a lot of the principles that Ruth and I talk, talk about um, are part of part and parcel of how to move forward. Okay, so let's let's talk about that way out and a bit try and be a bit more specific. And because because people are really worried and they want to see, you know, it's it's fine to talk about the problems and how we may have got here and yeah. and the complexity of things. What should we be doing right now uh, to to get ourselves out of the current crises that we're in? You know, are there particular ways we should be operating? Whether it's the climate crisis, whether it's racism, whether it's to do with pandemic. You know, are there ways we should be doing things differently? Are there certain countries that maybe handle things in a different way that we should be learning from? Um, yes. Um, Ruth, you want me to go first or you want yeah, to Yeah, please, go ahead. So we happen to have a paper come out yesterday in Nature, which talks, which compares peaceful societies and non-peaceful societies. And so we have learned a lot from studying these sustainably peaceful societies. These are societies that have been peaceful for 50, 100, 200 years. They're oftentimes peaceful with, uh, in, in a cluster of societies um, and we learn a lot from them. And again, some of the basic principles that, it, um, that Ruth point, points out in her book like the importance of diversity or what we would call complexity. So what happens in, in conflicts or under situations of threat is that we tend to think in smaller and smaller ways in more and more simplistic ways. We tend to feel a lot of negativity and no positivity. We're, we're, our, our world, our experience and our perceptions of the world tends to collapse and it can then become self-organized in a very small and simple way. This is true from the study of like chronic illness. In chronic illness, you see the time scale shifts. And so instead of thinking years out, you think in moments out about managing your pain. And so, you know, this psychologically is what happens and what we find, you know, so if you have a long-term conflict with another group, you tend to oversimplify your understanding of them and us and the issues that we, um, that we differ on. And part of what helps is reintroducing complexity, reintroducing nuance into your understanding. So a simple example would be this. My recommendation to our audience would be to find three people who believe, who think politically fundamentally differently from you, but who you have respect for, who you think are intelligent and thoughtful. That doesn't mean you have to follow the insane fringe. It means that you should find thoughtful people who differ fundamentally from your point of view and follow them and listen to them and think with them. And that's one way to reintroduce nuance, uh, you know, reduce certainty and reintroduce some sense of doubt and possibility into our thinking and into our opinions. Yeah. Ruth? Well, it's interesting to see that the countries that experience SARS uh, have done better in managing uh, COVID-19. And I think that that mirrors uh, the trial and error process in evolution, that the more we experience these kinds of shocks, the better we will get at building in ways to be resilient uh, to them. So what I would, <laughs> what is against human nature, but so important, and Peter addresses this also in his book, is that between shocks, <laughs> between conflicts, to use that time to build in the uh, preparedness 
because we know shocks are coming, even though it's human nature when they're over to want to forget about them, but to build in that time. And I'm sure that the um, Biden-Harris team is thinking about uh, building up preparedness. So, okay, so let, let's have a quick, you know, one sentence from each of you on this. You know, if you were to sit down with the Biden-Harris team, with, with Biden and Harris tonight and give them some advice, uh, things they might do to um, that might be a somewhat bold departure from normal government operations to help take this forward. What what would, what things would you think of, Peter? Well, I would say two things quickly. One would be that I would encourage the administration not to talk about healing and unity yet. There are too many enraged people on both sides, and you'll push them away if you try to bring them together too quickly. So what I would encourage them to focus on is the fact that this, this polarization, this degree of polarization is toxic. It is a toxic pathology. Um, and, so, and like COVID, we can apply evidence-based practices to addressing that kind of toxicity and reducing this toxicity. It is a first order pro problem in our world because it disables our capacity to solve our other problems. If we can't come together enough politically to think and talk to each other. So one thing I would say is talk less about unity and healing and talk more about the need to take, uh, I have a piece out called the war on polarization. We need to focus on that problem that will mobilize more people in service of bringing the temperature down. But the only other thing I would, I, I need to stress is that in these systems that become so change resistant, what we find is that coming in from the outside with some new plan or problem is oftentimes very ineffective or unsustainable. What you wanna do is identify what works. So Ruth describes this as working locally or from the bottom up. And it is about identifying in this country today, there are thousands of bridge building organizations in every community um, and in most sectors, you know, there's in entertainment and media and journalism and in, in education, there are groups that try to bring progressives and conservatives together to understand things in a different way, to generate new policies. Those groups are the kind of, they're, they're our societal immune system. They're already working actively to overcome hate and vilification. So it is about what I've recommended to the Biden administration is that they find them, they celebrate them, they recognize them, and they try to carefully support and scale their impact because they're already working in communities. Um, we know that they can. You don't wanna disrupt that by br bringing too much attention to them and destabilizing them, but you wanna provide them with the support that they need in order to have more of a, a, a local impact. Okay. Ruth, is there anything quickly you would add in terms of things you would tell Biden and Harris? Well, I don't have a very satisfying answer. I have a frustrating answer, but I think it's right, <laughs> is that we live in a complex world. So for the big complex problems that are not amenable to quick fixes, silver bullets, you know, one piece of legislation, is that to, to think about the fundamental ways that we organize society and what investments we make that, that can make this the century of, uh, of resilience. So to, to, to not be intoxicated by a search for, for uh, silver bullets, which could backfire. Okay, right. So that's very helpful. We're gonna, I'm just gonna ask you quickly for one takeaway line that you wanna give people. Uh, but but, but um, once we've heard the takeaway lines, um, you know, we're going to be opening up the um, to our audience out there, uh, 400 people. If you want to ask questions, you should be sending them in right now and we'll queue them up and they'll be, I won't, we won't be able to answer all the questions, I'm afraid, engage with and deal with all of them, but I'll, I'll try and get through a few. My colleagues will do a triage, so start sending your questions in. Uh, that would be re really helpful right now. So um, uh, just to wrap up before we go to the questions, um, Peter, Ruth, what would be your one takeaway message you'd like to leave the audience tonight? Ruth, after you. Okay, well, I would say that um, as individuals, we have limited impact, but we can support the leaders or become the leaders who 
uh, who think about the ways to build resilience in communities, in government, at the international level, in businesses, whatever level, whatever scale people are engaged with, we can, we can collectively support and be those, those leaders who, who think about the world as in all of its complexity. Okay, Peter? One thing I would say is that if you find yourself trapped in a relationship with someone who politically is different from you, you can't see eye to eye, you're angry, you're frustrated, you love them, but, you, but it's become too toxic. My recommendation is not that you sit down and try to talk it out. My recommendation is that you go for a walk outside. One of the things we found from neuroscience is that moving together jointly, ideally walking together and ideally outside, is a way to kind of synchronize your mirror neurons, to synchronize your sense of cooperation, and it enhances creativity and flexibility, positivity, and connectedness between people. It can promote empathy. So um, it's, a, it's something that's underutilized in our world. So I would say, take your, your opponent for a walk. <laughs> okay, so socially distant. <laughs> Right. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah. So, okay. So let's go to some questions. Some questions coming in right now. Um, so the first one is actually about climate change, really, because the climate is changing, but it's doing it over, you know, a lot of these things are long term and we're worried about the future, but actually the crisis is really about the fact that the things are going to be baked into the future of the planet. So it's not like, you know, storming the capital or something like this. It's actually a sort of crisis to do with what we're doing for the future. So what can we do to galvanize activity on this on this issue when it's such a long-term thing that doesn't have quite that same sense of, you know, gal galvanizing um, impact as, as seeing Washington uh, on January the 6th? Ruth? Yeah, okay. Uh, climate is a really hard problem exactly because of what you said, it's, it's, it's long-term, although we see the impacts on very short time scales, such as uh, extreme climate events and, and, uh, and floods. So it's, um, it's recognized, again, sort of going back against human nature, which is to put off the long-term problems and to address them uh, because there's such a, it's such a, the atmosphere is such an enormous ship to, to, to move <laughs> that, uh, that we are committed to, to climate change. And I think we, we um, while focusing very much on reducing emissions, focusing equally on preparing for the climate events and climate extremes, which we know are in store, uh, particularly for uh, the uh, vulnerable communities who are most at risk is, uh, is something that I, I think the Biden administration is paying attention to and, and really needs a lot of attention. Right, right. So Peter, um, can I ask you the next question? Um, can we look to historical examples for how to go from a highly polarized to a more pluralistic society? And um, what has helped make that happen before? Have you got you know, things you can draw upon in terms of what's made a difference in the past? Absolutely. Um, so again, I, I mentioned that there's a, a paper out in Nature yesterday. There's a paper in the American Psychologist this month as well on our work on sustainable peace. And all of these societies, so first thing to know is there are sustainably peaceful societies around the world. Um, and all of them have a history of at some point being at war with different, you know, there, you'll have different ethnic groups that are at war sometimes for generations. And at some point they do reach a breaking point and a tipping point. So Costa Rica is one example. Costa Rica had a terribly bloody civil war and came out of that in 1948 and really said enough and decided intentionally to dismantle their military, to take that, their uh, um, money from that and invested in healthcare and education and, and the economy. Um, and they grew a more tolerant society. They intentionally decided to do this. But these are stories that you hear in Singapore and in Mauritius and in Botswana. 
there is an intentionality to this. It does take leadership, but it also takes political will. It takes the people saying enough. We don't want to support this anymore. It's insane. Um, and we need to do something fundamentally different. And that's a, a common pattern with all of these societies that we study. Right. Do you, so this is a question for both of you. Um, do you have a particular target audience in mind? This is sort of how to write a book, which I've never done, I must admit. So I'm, I'm <laughs> deeply impressed by the fact you've done this. Uh, do you have a target audience in mind when you begin to write your book? Or does that sort of develop as you start to write and, and then do you tear it up and start again and develop it in a different way as you start to imagine who might try and read it? How do, how do you do this? Ruth, Ruth how do you do this? Uh, how do you do this? Uh, well, my target audience is uh, is uh, someone who is interested but not not an expert on the on topics. So, what my goal in in this book and in the Big Ratchet as well was to take sort of abstract, complex concepts and make them accessible and readable and find the narratives that tell the story. Um, so it's challenging, but it's really fun to try to read a lot of different stories and see how they can be used to illustrate uh, yeah. different concepts, like Paul Barron. And there's a lot of characters like that uh, in the book. It is amazing the the, the 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 kaleidoscope of stuff you bring together in your in your writing to illustrate what you're trying to say and to tell the story. The narrative is, is astonishing. But my biggest fear is is uh, to be boring. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We'll tell you when you get there. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Peter, how about you? Do you, do you, yeah. do you have an audience in mind or not? Uh, again, uh, so, you know, I, I publish a lot of scientific articles and journals that nobody reads. So <laughs> what I am interested in is trying to communicate this to a more general audience. Um, and particularly this current book on polarization, it's so relevant to people's family life these days and to their community life and to their work spaces and, you know, it scales up. So um, it is, uh, I, I have attempted to write this book and to story this book in a way that resonates with most readers. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's adults, but it's, you know, a general lay audience. So it's not a technical book. And that's, as Ruth said, it's very difficult to take concepts from physics or engineering and story them in a way that resonates. So that is a challenge, but it is a, it is kind of a fun challenge. I don't know how well I've done it, but I'm, that's what I'm working on. Okay, so just, uh, we're gonna have to answer these quite quickly. There's, there's some interesting questions coming in. So uh, first question is about, um, I'm gonna take these in a slightly different order. So Ruth, this is for you. Uh, we might not prepare too well for unpredictable challenges, but are prepared for somehow predictable challenges. Where are we at with predictable challenges and shocks? So, um, you know, the things we think are, you know, so are there ways in which we think we we think differently and actually prepare better for things that we think are going to be that we know are going to be happening? Well, with the pandemic, it was quite predictable. Infectious disease uh, experts have been predicting for a very long time that something like this would inevitably happen. Can't yeah. predict exactly from where, whether it was Wuhan or someplace else, or, uh, or exactly when, but that something like this would happen. And in fact, diseases have spilled over into humans uh, many times and will continue to, uh, to right. um, do so. An interesting thing is that there was a, um, an index of, uh, in 2019, put together for countries' preparedness for, um, I believe it was for health, health security threats. And I'll give you a guess about which country was rated number one and number two for preparedness. Number one was the US and number one, two was the UK. So that just shows oh. us that we have a lot of surprises in store. Okay, okay. So let's quickly move on. Um, there's a question here about social media. So this is for you, Peter. Um, how can social media platforms address polarization by altering their algorithms, exposing people to different points of view rather than producing an echo chamber? Or is it not that simple? 
Well, I think the, my diagnosis of the problem with social media is that uh, the competitive nature of it is built into the basic business model of Facebook and Twitter. Most of them are set up to compete, to compete socially in terms of social comparison, to you know, contend with others, to take them on, to challenge them. That's this space. It's not a space that is, encourages dialogue and discovery and learning. It is a space that encourages competition and, and more, more and more contentious conflict because that's what sells, that's what goes viral when there's a smarmy attack against someone, right? So that's the business model and they know this. Um, and of course, it's also been, you know, Facebook has been weaponized um, in Myanmar and South Sudan um, in service of genocide. So it, it, it can be that bad or it can just be creating a toxic kind of dynamic socially for many people so the problem is it's, it is part of their fundamental business model. They know it and they're not willing to move away from it. So I think it ultimately is going to be something that will have to be either negotiated or will have to be um, regulated um, in some ways. You know, and, and the idea of breaking Facebook up, for example, is one way to do that. You bring in competition where there's less of that and you start to see more diversity in the platforms. Okay. So I think we're going to have to wrap this up. Um, I, uh, there's another great question here about capitalism and whether it's whether it's the right model going forward. But we're running out of time, I think. So do you want to answer that, Peter? <laughs> so I think, you know, I, actually, I don't know the answer to this, but whether capitalist-centered economic models are more or less conducive to addressing complex problems. What do you think, Peter? Well, again, it depends on your take on capitalism. I don't think free market capitalism is. I think that's a fantasy, right? I think it is, that's an unregulated system. And I think there needs to be, as Booth's book points out, there needs to be ways, stop gaps that shut things down and help self-correct. Um, it is a highly complex system, the market system, um, but capitalism has, of course, all kinds of pathologies and it assumes a sort of basic human decency that isn't always evident in its action. Okay. Ruth, any points? Well, just as Peter said, uh, uh, a market economy is a, is a complex system in the extreme. So, uh, so as we were discussing before, and it doesn't mean it's all bad or it's all good or we should do away with everything about capitalism or accept everything about capitalism, but to find how to have the benefits of capitalism, which does go back to the self-organizing principle, but also have the uh, have the mechanisms in place that reduce, minimize the risks from capitalism. Okay, right. We've got to wrap this up. I just want to say thank you to Ruth and Peter. Uh, amazing. Get the books, read them. They're fantastic and wonderful to have you both with us tonight um, in this engaging conversation. Uh, look forward to tomorrow's inauguration. It's big, great to be in America at this time. See this happening, and uh, I'd like to just finish by thanking all the people who've helped to put this forward and made it, make it everything happening tonight, happen tonight, especially the audience. And thanks for coming along, asking questions. And also uh, thanks to our donors who support the work of the Earth Institute. The Earth Institute and the, the climate school that we're building, uh, we believe is the best place in the world for actually tackling many of these difficult, complex problems around the future sustainability of the planet. So please connect with us, engage with us, and we look forward to talking with you further at the, the next event. So thank you very much and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.